So for a while now I've had an idea to combine the speed of a Minecraft computer with the power of an x86 computer. And recently I've also been getting requests to make tutorials on how Minecraft computers work. So I figured it might be an idea to actually turn my project of combining x86 and Minecraft computers into sort of a tutorial format. Of course to do this properly I have to assume that my viewers know absolutely nothing and we have to start from square one. Since computers work with numbers, it's important to understand how a computer processes numbers. Now as humans, we typically process numbers in base 10, and the way we look at a number like 9,564 is typically described as 9 groups of 1,000, 5 groups of 100, 6 groups of 10, and 4 groups of 1. We get those numbers based on its position. So for example, the 9 is in the third position, and what we do is we take the base that we're working with, in this case 10, we raise it to the position and we multiply it by the number. So 10 raised to the third is 1,000, multiplied by 9 is 9,000. Likewise, with the second position with the 5, 10 raised to 2 is 100, multiplied by 5 is 500. 9,500, 6 tens, and 4 ones. Unfortunately, computers don't have the luxury of counting with 10 digits. They can only count in two digits, either a 0 or a 1. This is referred to as base 2 or binary, and the counting system works exactly the same way. We simply take the base, raise it to the position, and multiply it by the number. In this case, if it's a 1, it's that value. If it's a 0, it's nothing. So reading this number off, what we have is 2 raised to 3, which is 8, multiplied by 1. Then we have 2 raised to the 1, which is 2, multiply by 1. Reading this number off, we have 8 plus nothing plus 2 plus nothing. This number right here, 1010, 0, 1, 0, is binary for 10. A quick and easy way to convert binary numbers into decimal numbers is to simply assign every bit of value, starting at the right with 1 and then doubling it as you go along. So the next one will be 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. Then you simply add the value of that bit, if the bit is on, to the total number, and you'll get your number. For example, if I were to set the numbers 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, you can see that we are not adding 128, we're not adding 64, we're not adding 32, we are not adding 16, but we are adding 8, we are adding 4, so now it's 12, we are adding 2, so now it's 14, and we are adding 1, so it's 15. This number, in decimal, is 15. One thing to understand, of course, is if you limit the number of digits you can have in a number, say in base 10 you limit to three digits, it drastically limits the maximum number that you can count to. For example, with only three digits, you can count to 999 in base 10. You can think of this as the base, 10, raised to the number of digits that you have, 3 minus 1. So with base 10 and three digits, we have 10 raised to 3, which is 1,000, minus 1, which is 999. The same rule applies in binary. If you have a 4-bit number, the highest number we can count to is 2 raised to the 4, which is 16, minus 1, which is 15. And if we were at the value of the bits together, again, we would find that it is 15. Arithmetic also works the same way in base 2. In base 10, if you were to add two numbers together, you would start at the very least significant number and add down. And if the number was greater than the base, we would then take the access and carry it over to the next column. The same thing applies in binary. So if we were to add 0 plus 1, the answer is 1. But if we added 1 plus 1, suddenly the answer is 0 because we can't count to 2. So we roll over to 0 and we carry over to the next column. So then we add those together, 1 plus 1 plus 0. Well, 1 plus 1 is 0, carry the 1, plus 0 is 0. So we carry the 1 to the next column. Likewise, in this, 1 plus 1 plus 0 is again 0, carry the 1. If we were to convert the three numbers that we have here, you can see here that we've got 8 plus 4 plus 2, which is 14, and 2 plus 1, which is 3. 14 plus 3 is 17, and if we were to count this out, that value is 16 plus 1 is 17. You can also subtract with binary numbers, but it's a little bit difficult to do. So instead what computers will do is they'll add signed numbers. In other words, instead of saying 4 minus 3, they'll often say 4 plus negative 3. The way that computers oftentimes denote negative numbers is through a method called two's complement. It's really quite simple. It works the same way as normal complemented numbers, except the very last bit, the most significant bit, is flipped from a positive to a negative value. So if I wanted to represent the number negative 3, I simply flip the most significant bit to denote that it is a negative number. Then because this is a 4-bit number, my number is now set to negative 8. 
So I want to go up to get to negative 3. So I add 4 to get to negative 4. If I add 2, I'll be moved to negative 2, so I don't want that, but I will add 1, which will bring me to negative 3. An easy way to convert from positive to negative numbers is to simply take your positive integer and invert all the bits. So if they're off, turn them on, and if they're on, turn them off. Then add 1 to the number, and you now have negative 3. Doing the same thing to an already negative number will actually result in its positive equivalent. So if I were to take the negative 3 again, which is already in 2's complement form, and I did the same algorithm, inverting all the bits, then adding 1, you'll notice that we now have a 3. Using the 14 minus 3 example, if I want to subtract 3 minus 14, I would first have to convert the 3 into its 2's complement form. I can then add as I normally would, so starting at the very least significant column, we have 0 plus 1, which is 1. We have 1 plus 0, which is 1. We have 1 plus 1, which is 0, carry. And then now that we have three ones in a row, I can show you something interesting. If I were to add 1 plus 1, it would be 0, carry the 1, but now we have a 0 plus a 1. So the result is now 1, 1. Looking at the result of this subtraction, we can clearly see that the number is 16 plus 8, which is 24, plus 2, which is 26, plus 1, which is 27. And last I checked, 14 minus 3 is not 27. The reason why the result is wrong is because we're adding this extra bit at the end of the result here. This is what's referred to as the carry slash borrow bit. When adding two positive integers together, uh, it, if the result is bigger than the number can handle, the extra bit will go into this bit right here and be called the carry. However, in subtraction, it is referred to as the borrow. By default, it is always on, and if the number ends up being negative, it turns off. So now ignoring that bit, if we were to add these numbers together, 8 plus 2, which is 10, plus 1 is 11. If we were to take 14 minus 3, the result is, in fact, 11. This was basically a crash course in binary numbers. Now, obviously, there's a lot more concepts that I could cover, uh, but for the time being, we have enough information to carry on. So I would highly recommend in your own time just taking some time to really study how binary numbers work and all that you can do with them. Trust me, it'll really help you in the long run. Since a computer is a machine that works with numbers, we need to create a circuit of some kind that can manipulate numbers. That is what I'm doing right here. I'm creating a circuit called an ALU, which stands for Arithmetic Logic Unit. Uh, this is essentially what does all the calculations for a computer. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about it or you'd like to build one yourself, I have a tutorial video on my channel which I will link here. The one where the two inputs are one. Um, if I were to go ahead and turn on the uh, exclusive OR output, uh, you'll notice that the only um, two outputs that have a one are the ones that have a one or a zero. So we've built our ALU, and we've made it 16 bits wide, which means the largest number that we can count to is 65,535. And I've already went ahead and loaded it up with our 14.3 example here. Uh, so I've told the ALU to add the numbers together, and as you can see, the result is 17. So now we have a circuit that does the calculations for us, which means now we don't have to spend time doing calculations manually. Now, of course, the circuit does also have a few tricks up its sleeve. I mentioned that the only way to subtract numbers is to twos complement them and add them together. Well, this circuit has some special features that actually automatically twos complements the secondary input and adds them together, creating a synthesized subtraction machine. So now if we were to look at the number, we have 14 minus 3 equals 11. On top of being able to do arithmetic, this circuit can also do something called logic functions. And logic functions is where you perform a bitwise logic operation on two numbers. This seems pretty useless at first, but trust me, as you get to know your computer system, you will find that these functions are actually incredibly useful. So the first one we've got here is what's known as a bitwise AND, and what we're doing is we're taking the uh, bits of each number and bitwise ANDing them together. And so if the two inputs are both on, the output is on. We also have a bitwise OR, which looks at the bits and turns the output on if either of the inputs are on. A bitwise NOT, which inverts the A input or the B input. As well as something called a rotate right, which takes the number on the A input and moves it over by one bit. 
The type of operation that this circuit performs is controlled by the control lines on this side here. By turning on and off different control lines, we can get the circuit to perform different operations with the numbers that we provide, making for an extremely versatile circuit. Now, obviously, when you sit in front of your real-life computer, you're not sitting here punching in numbers and watching it do calculations. That's what a calculator's for. So what we want is a self-contained system that can manage its own information. So what I'm doing here is I'm building something that allows this system to store the numbers that it creates and then use those numbers again in future equations. This is what's known as general purpose registers or working registers. Typical Minecraft computers will only have two of these. I'm giving this one eight because it'll actually serve a purpose later on. Most real life computers actually have eight to a few dozen registers. So we're gonna be giving this one eight for the sake of flexibility. Now what most Minecraft computers will do, as I said, is they'll give their ALUs two registers, and they'll usually be fixed registers, meaning you'll have one register tied to the A input, and another register tied to the B input. What I've gone and done is I've used something called dual read memory, uh, and of course I've used eight of them to connect to both the A and B input. And what this means is we have the ability to store eight individual numbers and map them to either the A or the B input. I chose to do it this way simply because there's a lot more flexibility in this design than there is with just having two registers. If you'd like to know how to build something like this, or if you want to know how something like this works, uh, this actually isn't my design. This is designed by SwiftX16, so I will have a link to his video on the screen here and in the description. So to go ahead and demonstrate some of the uh, flexibility of this design here, I went ahead and loaded up our first two registers with 14 and 3, and we're going to be doing our 14 operate 3 example here. So if we go ahead and we load 14 into the A bus by flipping the top lever, and 3 into the B bus by flipping the bottom lever, we can see 14 on the top bus and 3 on the bottom bus. Now what we can do is we can set this up for addition, and if we go to the top bus here, we can see the sum of 14 and 3, which is 17 on the top bus here. Now we can save this number to either the first or second register, overwriting what's already in that register, or we can save it to a new register, say register number 3. So now if we were to go over there, we will find that 17 is loaded in the register. Likewise, if I were to set this up for subtraction by 2's complementing the B input, we will find that the result is going to be 11, which we can then take and store in any of these registers. It really doesn't matter which one. We can overwrite what's already in these first three registers, or again, we can just save it to a new register. Now, because we have the option to change which register goes to which bus, we no longer have to just do 14 minus 3. We can also do 3 minus 14 simply by changing which register goes to which bus. So now, the second register goes to the A bus, and the first register goes to the B bus. The result is going to be negative 11. Now if you don't believe that this is actually negative 11, we can prove it right here by simply 2's complementing this number to get its positive equivalent. So again, what we need to do is invert each of the bits, and fortunately, uh, the registers actually require a negative input in order to work properly, so it's already been inverted for us. We simply need to do the next step, which is adding 1 to the value. So if we go to the end here, we can simply imagine that this set is turned on here. If we were to actually look, we have 8 plus 2 plus 1 is 11. I'm building something called a decoder here, which will make things a little easier down the road. Now, if you'd like to know more about decoders, I'll have links in the description to videos explaining the concept, as well as videos on the screen. Otherwise, if you want a tutorial for this particular decoder that I'm building right here, I'll have to make one eventually because this is my design and I haven't exactly released it yet.
These Minecraft computers are extremely time sensitive, so it's incredibly important to get the timing on these decoders correct. So the purpose of these decoders is to essentially take the number of lines that we would have needed to control all these registers and reduce them. So instead of needing eight lines to control the read B section of these registers, uh, we now only need four lines. Uh, technically we could get away with three, but what I've added is a fourth line here, which is an enable line, which actually prevents any of these lines from doing anything unless this line is active. With the enable line active, we can then select the register that we want to read from, and the appropriate line will turn off. I also went ahead and added a decoder to the A read lines and the write lines. So now we can select the write, read A, and read B lines with only a handful of control lines. So to make this next step a little easier, I went ahead and took all the control lines and extended them out to a nice level point so we can see them all at the same time. Before we go any further though, I do want to cover two topics that will make understanding these next points a little easier. The first is if you are going to extend these lines as I have done, it's important to get the timing for each group of wires exactly the same. Uh, for example here we have the uh, read A control lines. And you'll notice that uh, these first two lines here have three repeaters in them. And the next two lines here have only two. What I've done to compensate for this is I've set the first repeaters here on the first two lines with the two repeaters to two ticks. In total, each line takes three ticks to get from the lever to the input of the decoder. Likewise with the decoder, these first four decode points are instant. The ones after that come after this repeater, so there's a tick delay. So to compensate, I've put a one tick delay on each of these repeaters so that the signal gets to uh, these read lines at the same time. Of course, the timing for the read lines and the control lines for the ALU aren't nearly as critical as the timing for the write lines. These lines must be perfect in their timing because even the slightest missed adjustment by one tick on any of these lines can cause two or even more registers to write when you really only want one to write. So it's important to make sure that each of these lines come in at the exact same time and that the timing between the decoder and the actual write lines are the same. The other important thing to note is that I went ahead and put edge detection circuits on all the write lines. Now, a real quick crash course in edge detection. Basically what an edge detector does is it sends a quick pulse anytime there's a change in the redstone signal. So if it goes from high to low, or usually from low to high, it will create a very short pulse on the output. And of course, depending on the kind of edge detector that you use, in this case this is what's known as a rising edge detector, it will create a pulse on the rising edge, but not the falling edge. Now because this signal here is inverted, meaning it's high when it's deactivated and low when it's activated, even though the circuit's going into a rising edge detection, after we take into account the inversion, this is considered a falling edge detector. So what that means is when we flip the enable bit on, in fact I can do that right now, when we flip the enable bit on, one of these detectors is going to disable. When we flip the enable bit off, the falling edge will propagate and it will turn into a rising edge, which the rising edge detector will create a pulse as a result, allowing you to write on the falling edge of a signal. Now this is important because if we were to send the signals in at the same time, what would happen is the read would enable and it would propagate the signal through the system, and then as soon as we turn those signals off, the falling edge of this bit will cause it to write. Now that all seems very confusing and overly complicated for something as simple as this, but for what I'm about to show you, it is actually necessary. So now by pulling the signals out to a nice clean interface like this, this allows us to control this entire system from a relatively simple standpoint. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've loaded the registers again with 14 and 3, and I can show you now how easy it is to control this system to do what we wanted to do with the numbers we have stored in the registers. So for example, let's say again we want to add. We'll go ahead and enable sum. Then we'll go ahead and tell it with what registers we're going to be summing. So first things first, we're going to pick a register from A. And we want to add 14 on the A bus. So what we'll go ahead and do is select the very first register, which is register 0. Now as it 
stands, 0 is 0, 0, 0 across the board. So we don't need to do anything with that, but we do need to enable. So now that is sending 14 through the A bus into the ALU. Uh, we can then go to the B control lines, and we can tell it to put the first register, which is register 1, um, onto the B bus. Now, register 1 in binary is 0, 0, 1, so we'll go ahead and flip the 0 read bit on and we'll go ahead and enable read B. So now with this setup, 14 in the zeroth register is being sent through the A bus and 3, which is in the first register, is being sent through the B bus. Now we need to select what register we're going to be writing to. So we'll go ahead and write this to register 2, which in binary is 0, 1, 0. And then we need to enable. Now again, because we have that falling edge detection system in there, this won't actually write until we disable the write line. So if we go through here, we can see we have 14 in the first register, we have 3 in the second register, we have our answer in the result bus, but there's nothing in the register. We first have to shut off the enable bit to activate the system. So we shut off enable, and we go back to the register, and we find that our answer 17 is in the third register. So what we've essentially done is we've created a system that allows us to not only perform arithmetic on numbers but store those numbers in a set amount of registers. Essentially what we've created is a very fancy calculator. However this really doesn't quote compute if we wanted to do something extremely complicated, maybe a, an algorithm that requires multiple steps in order to come up with an answer, we'd have to run our signals in manually over and over and over again, and that is too inefficient. So what we need is a system that automatically loads our instructions into the system, allowing us to write a small program and letting it run one or multiple times, and creating the answer without us having to do much work. In order to do this, we need to create something called a lookup table. Now what a lookup table is, is several entries of information that we can reference either in order or randomly. This lookup table will store our encoded control information on multiple lines that we can then sequence through to create our program. This lookup table is oftentimes referred to as ROM or read-only memory, or as I like to call it, program memory. So now that we've attached a lookup table, or program memory as it is, uh, we can now load sequences of instructions into the program memory, as it were, to create a program. So, for example, in the last example that I showed you, we did a instruction that would take the contents of the first register and the second register, add them together, and store them in the third. I've recreated this instruction on this first line. Now, on the next line, I also created another instruction that takes the third register, increments it by one, and puts it back in the third register. In the third line, I then take the contents of the third register, subtract it from the contents of the second register, and store it in a fourth register. So to run our program, we simply need to activate each of these commands in the sequence that we want them to run. So by simply running the first command, we turn on the line, which then activates all the control lines, then the write happens of course on the falling edge, so by turning it off, the result is then stored in the third register. So if we go here, we have 14 in the first, 3 in the second, and the third register is now stored with our answer 17. We can then increment the value in that register by running the second command, which as I explained, increments the value in the third register. So by turning that on, then turning it off. We can now see that the value 17 should now be incremented to 18. We can now run the third line in our program which takes the value in the third register and subtracts the value in the second register and again stores the result in the fourth register. So if we go ahead and activate that, wait a second or two, and then deactivate it, we can now go over to the fourth register, which should be stored with the value 18 minus 3, which is 15. Now this is all well and fine, but it still requires us to do some work. We have to sit here going back and forth, activating each command in the program one at a time in its sequence. 
In order to get the system to run by itself, we need a circuit that can step through the program automatically without us needing to do anything. In order to do that, we create something called a program counter. Now, a program counter is another register that, when clocked, automatically increments the value found in the register by 1. We can then attach this register to something called a decoder, which is something we've already built for the registers, just slightly different for this design, and use that to select one line out of our program. This again is another decoder of my own design, one that I have not made a tutorial for, so as soon as I make one, I'll be sure to link it in the description. Counting. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, the way it's arranged, the digits are running, or the, the littlest digit is on the left here, but if you So now that we have a program counter and a decoder, we now have a system that allows us to run through our program in a sequential manner. So you'll notice that the register itself has the content of zero, and we are pointing at line zero. Well, if I were to go ahead and clock this register, the content of the register is automatically incremented to one, and the decoder then translates that as pointing to line one in the code. And of course, this will continue on every single time we clock the register with each clock pulse incrementing the value and progressing to the next line of code. This is all fine and good. We could stand here all day clocking a pulse ev all day long and, uh, you know, it still wouldn't be nearly as much work as calculating the stuff we want to calculate by hand, but it's a lot easier to just hook up a clock. So if we were to go ahead and hook up this clock here to this, what would end up happening is the computer would instantly start automatically running through its program. So, as it stands, I've given this computer 32 lines of program memory, which works if you're going to make a program with 32 lines in it. But if you have a program that's only three lines long, you're going to run into a problem. You have to wait for the program counter to cycle through all 32 lines before cycling back to the beginning. This can be a problem, like I said, if you only have a program that's maybe three or four lines long because you have to wait for it to cycle before it can repeat itself. So what we need is we need a way of causing the program to break its sequence and jump to another line. If you've already went ahead and watched the video on how to make the program counter, you'll know that there's already another input on the other side here that allows us to inject values rather than just relying on its sequential counting. We can then connect those lines to some more outputs on the program memory, allowing us to inject values directly into the program counter. But there is a problem. The problem is we need to be able to tell the program counter when we want it to increment and when we want it to jump to a different address. Now, we can do this with a simple multiplexer, and all we have to do is just stand up here, and when we see that it's at an address that we want to change, we simply have to mux it to the input. The problem with this, of course, is this again requires the user interacting with the computer and taking care of a role that it can take care of itself. So what we need is a circuit that can do this automatically. Before we get into that circuit, though, we need to understand one more key concept about the ALU. When you perform an operation in the ALU, on top of generating the answer, the ALU can also generate auxiliary information that can be used to describe attributes of the operation. What I mean by this is, if you were to send two numbers in to the ALU, you can have a line that turns on when the two numbers are equal. You can also have a line that turns on if the answer is equal to zero. You can also have a line that turns on if the answer is too big, or a line that turns on if the answer is negative. These lines are called flags. There are many kinds of flags that an ALU can generate, and I would highly recommend researching them on your own time. But the three most common that you'll find in almost any CPU is the negative flag, the zero flag, and the carry flag. The negative flag is on when a number is negative, and that's fairly easy to hook up. It's simply connected directly to the most significant bit of your number. The reason being is because when you two's complement a number, the very last bit denotes if it's a negative or a positive. It's a one if it's negative, and zero if it's a positive. The zero flag is on if the number that is generated is equal to zero. 
This is quite easy to hook up as it's simply taking all of the output bits and tying them to a NOR gate. In other words, the output will only be on if all of the bits are off. If any of the bits are on, this means that the number is not zero and the flag turns off. The last flag is the carry flag. Now this carry flag is taken directly from the carry output of the last full adder. In other words, because this entire system is made up of full adders with a carry that propagates from the least significant bit to the most significant bit, the very last bit has a carry that goes nowhere. We simply tap this off and send it to a flag line to indicate if the number that we're generating is too big. We can then take these three flags and store them in something called a flag register, which is simply another register on the computer that is specifically designed to store the flag information. We can also control when this flag register is written to with another line in program memory. What we can now do is we can take the individual outputs of the flag register and AND each bit with a bit from program memory. We can then take the result of that logic AND and OR them together into one line. What this allows us to do is it allows us to select the state of each flag and send it to the line. So if I were to go ahead and select the line for the zero flag, you'll find that the line turns on. That's because the state of the zero flag is on. But if I were to go ahead and select the carry flag, the state is off because the state of the flag is off. You can also use a decoder to select your flags. If you have a lot of flags in your CPU, this can be extremely handy as it allows you to save on bits. But it is disadvantageous because you can only select one flag at a time. For what we're doing though, this will work just fine. Now this is another decoder of mine that uh, I've yet to release a tutorial on, so that is something that I'll have to do. But when I do that, there will be a link in the description and in the video. But the way this works is quite simple. We simply use binary combinations to select the flag again. 0, 0, in this case, selects nothing. If we select 0, 1, we end up selecting the carry flag on the far left here. In fact, if we were to change the status of that to a 1, you can see the 1 on the output. Notice, though, that changing no other states will affect the other lines. Selecting 1, 0 will select the 0 flag and send the result of the zero flag to the line. Finally, selecting 1-1 one, one will select the negative flag and send the result of the negative flag to the line. Finally, we send the result bit through an exclusive OR gate. What this allows us to do is choose if we want to invert the result line or leave it as it is. By default, it's inverted, and we can choose to uninvert it with another line from program memory. So if you look at this the way it is, if there is a 0 on the result line, there's a 1 on the output. And if there's a 1 on the result line, there's a 0 on the output. But we can undo this inversion using the line on the program memory. Turning it on sends it through as it is, so if there's a 0 on the input, there's a 0 on the output. And if there's a 1 on the input, there's a 1 on the output. So I just realized that I made a few mistakes here when I was making this computer. This input on the exclusive OR gate does in fact need to be inverted. And the reason being is we want the signal to be inverted when this line is on. The other thing that I forgot to invert was the input to the flag register. The right line needs to be a falling edge detection. So for that reason you need an inverter here. So, so far, I've only managed to show you a really confusing circuit that simply keeps track of the status of operations in the ALU and produces a result depending on which bit we're selecting and whether or not we're negating it and what the status of the bit is. It's all really confusing and it doesn't really answer the question that I proposed earlier, which was, how do we get the computer to decide when it's appropriate to increment to the next instruction or to jump to a different instruction? The answer, believe it or not, is right in front of you. This little circuit is what allows the computer to decide whether or not it should increment or branch. So we simply take the result of the exclusive OR gate and send it all the way to the input of the MUX gate. What this means is so long as this line is off, the clock pulses will be directed to the side of the counter that increments the program counter. In other words, so long as this line is off, the program will continue to increment as it normally would. But as soon as the line is turned on, the clock pulses are redirected to the right side, which means now we can enter a custom address causing the program counter 
to jump to a different address in program. Now you might be wondering to yourself, how on earth does this circuit dictate when the computer increments and when it jumps? Well, think of it like this. Say you have a program that increments a number and you want the program to jump to a different part of the program if the number becomes too big for the registers. What you can do is you can check the carry flag and if the carry flag is on, that means that the number is too big, which means it'll send a 1 to the result bit, and since we're not inverting it, it'll send a 1 down the line. And as I said before, if a 1 is present here, the clock cycles will be redirected to the right line, and the program counter will jump to whatever address we give it down below. We can also perform a jump if a flag is not on, thanks to that inverter down there. Think of it again like this. Let's say we had a program that checked to see if a uh, number was not bigger than its register's width. What you could do is you could check the carry bit and then run it through the inverter. What this will do is it'll send a signal if the carry bit is off. This means that so long as the carry bit is off, a 1 will be sent down this line, changing the mux, and redirecting the clock pulses to the right side, jumping to whatever address we supply it, from down here. Other than that, if you were to go over the entire computer, make sure all the signals reach where they need to reach, and then make sure that the computer is running relatively fast, but slow enough that the uh, signals can make their way through the computer and the carry can propagate through the ALU properly, you now pretty much have a functioning Minecraft computer. With this computer design, we are able to store information in the registers, move information from registers to other registers, perform operations between two registers, and based off of the information that we gather from those operations and store in the flag register, we can change the way the program flows by jumping to other parts of the program. All in all, this makes for what is known as a Turing complete computer. But enough talking about theory, it's time to put my money where my mouth is. I'm going to go ahead and run this computer for you so that you can see it running its first program. Now the program I've loaded into the program memory is a multiplication program. Basically it starts like this. The first instruction takes the information in the second register and adds it to the information in the third register. Now the second register is initially loaded with 28 and the third register is initially loaded with 0. This means that it's essentially adding 28 to 0, which is 28, it then stores that information in the third register. The next line of program code then takes the first register, which is initiated with 14, and decrements it, clocking the flag register in the process. The third line of code then looks at the flag register and checks to see if the zero flag is off. If it is off, it then jumps back to line zero. However, if it's on, then we know that register one is loaded with a zero. We then move on to the fourth line of code, which takes the information found in register three and moves it to register eight. I have some lamps connected to register eight on the back of the computer, which will allow us to see what's inside register eight. From line four, it then moves to line five, which does nothing, and then moves to line six, which jumps back to line five. This essentially halts the program. So the result of my little multiplication program there, which multiplied 14 by 28, should result in 392, which converted to binary is 11000100. And as you can see, that's what I've got right here. Now for the more experienced redstoners and Minecraft computer enthusiasts, this may have been a little bit mundane to watch. But for what I'm about to do with this particular computing system, it's important that we're all on the same page here and we all have a very good understanding of how these Minecraft computers work. That said, of course, we are not done here. There is still lots that we are going to do to this computer to improve it and make it more powerful than it already is. But that's all going to have to happen in another video because this one is already getting long enough. So. Hopefully you enjoyed this brief introduction into the concepts of a Minecraft computer. If you liked it, be sure to indicate that you liked it by leaving a thumbs up on this video. And be sure to comment any questions that you may have. I'll be more than happy to answer them. Otherwise, if you'd like notifications on when I do videos like this in the future, be sure to hit subscribe and make sure that bell is ringing. 
Otherwise, if you'd like notifications on what videos I intend on working on next, or which ones I'm working on now, be sure to follow me on Twitter at Nubasaurus. Links will be in the description. And with that said, be sure to join me in the next video where we will be adding RAM to this computer, as well as I.O. devices, and introducing you to concepts like direct and indirect addressing, and register pointers. I'll see you then. Bye!